we go. Now we're recording and uh, we'll be on YouTube. Uh, I'll post that after this today, but let's go to our video now. And, uh, whoops, hang on, let me, forgot to click this button, share screen, share screen. Okay, here. That's why they're committing suicide. Maybe right now, God is speaking to you. Maybe you were sexually abused as a child and you find yourself same-sex attracted today. Maybe you came from a very dysfunctional and broken family with no good role models to follow and you feel like you're a man trapped in a woman's body. Or maybe your upbringing was fine and you were never abused, but you just don't seem to fit into normal heterosexual categories. I want you to know that God cares. He's not indifferent to your struggles. He wants to see you completely whole from the inside out. That's why he sent his son Jesus to die for your sins and to heal your brokenness. And it was Jesus who said to a religious Jewish man, not some gross worldly sinner, you must be born again. That tells me that everyone from the drug addict down the streets to the church going mom, every single one of us falls short of God's standards and needs to receive forgiveness of sins, and find new life in Jesus. So no matter how you were born, no matter where you find yourself in life today, the message is the same. You must be born again. In Jesus, there really is hope for you. Or you could be watching this and it's not you, but it's your friend or family or someone in your church who's struggling with their sexuality or gender identity and you just have no idea what to do. Consider this. God has placed you in their life for a reason. You have a unique opportunity to pray for them, to love them, to listen to them, and to speak truth and hope to them. You could be their lifeline to change and transformation. And one of the most powerful ways you can do this is to share your own story. Has God truly transformed your life? Has he changed you? Has he set you free from anything? It starts there. I'm Francine Perry. I am the mother of Laura Perry, and I would just like for all of you to know that prayer changes things. And as you submit to the Holy Spirit, I believe he will work in your prodigal and you will see a miracle in your life. When Laura announced that she was going to be transgender, I went home that night. Paul and I said not one word to each other for an hour drives home. And when I got home that night, I just laid face down on the floor. I thought we had done so much right, but yet here we are, the parents of a transgender child who had walked away from the Lord. And it was very clear to me that God said in my heart, only one of us is gonna work on her. If you want me to work on her, then you go sit down and you focus on your relationship with me. And I just gave him total control of her and me for six months. And he began to do a work in me and I knew I was changing even though I saw nothing in her at that point. She knew how we felt. We don't need to beat her over the head with it every time we see her. My mom just refused to call me Jake and it made me so mad at the time. And I said, you have got to accept this. This is who I am and you're just gonna have to get over it and you need to use male pronouns and all this. And she never would. And it just drove me up the wall. I never called her by her desired name, ever, because that's not who she is. That's not who she was. That's not who God created. And I never said he and she much. I just called her honey. Everybody else was calling me Jake. Everybody else I knew, I was only known as Jake at work, by my partner, by my friends, and that kept me tethered to that reality that that's who I was and I was constantly reminded I was their daughter and not their son. Well, my Bible study was growing to the point that they wanted me to begin recording and make the lessons available online and Laura has background to be able to do that. So I called her one day and I said, would you like to do the website, build it, create it and maintain it? I really wasn't even motivated by helping her. I really needed the money and the experience, but I thought this would be a nice part of the website. So as I'm trying to read her notes to make a summary for each lesson, all of a sudden I'm seeing love in the Bible for the first time in my life and seeing God's faithfulness. And I'm just blown away by the things that she's learned. 
And I started thinking over the last few months, I said, Mom, you have really changed. What's going on? And so she talked to me about how she had really surrendered her life to Christ, and now she didn't just have a Christian religion, um, but she had true faith, and she was being changed by the Holy Spirit, and she was surrendered to Him, and He was changing her. And I just, I, it was at that moment that I knew the gospel was true. I knew that it wasn't just true intellectually, it wasn't just true stories, but it really was the truth. And I knew that Christ was alive. I had seen His transforming power in my mom, and I knew if He could change my mom from somebody who was all about legalism and rules into somebody that was loving and filled with faith, I knew it was real. So that night I went home and I prayed, just repented of my sins, but I had trouble believing that God would forgive me. I had spit in God's face. I had denied Him to so many people and I'd spent so many years running from Him and I'd completely um, changed my entire identity and my body and I just felt like used goods. And so I, I prayed and I said, Lord, I want to be used by you again. I want to serve you, but I don't know. Is there still hope for me? Can you still use someone like me? And after that, like, I just felt totally transformed in this. I felt like light was bursting forth from me and I knew I was completely changed. And I really began to grow in my faith. I, I was so hungry for the word. I started listening to my audio Bible um, all day long at work. I would listen to either that or Bible teaching of some kind, some kind of Bible study. The Lord began to convict me little by little. He didn't leave me there, you know, in being transgender and slowly the conviction started to come. As I'm sitting there thinking about it one night, the Lord very clearly said, if you stood before me tonight, what name would I call? And I was very stunned by that because I thought, I just had convinced myself that God would accept me as Jake and I had pictured myself showing up in heaven as a boy. And I didn't really answer at first, but I knew that he was not gonna call me Jake. God said, let me tell you who you are. And it was the most loving voice I've ever heard in my life. The creator of all the universe had said, you know, let me tell you who you are because my identity is not something for me to go search out. We hear in culture all the time, we need to find ourselves. We need to go find our identity. We are already defined. We are known before the foundations of the world. But as I began to pray, I began to tell the Lord that I was willing, but I didn't know how. And I remember thinking, God, I have destroyed my body. I've, you know, I've had chest surgery. I've taken all these hormones. And I've, I, like, I don't know that I'll ever look like a girl again. But I know I can't keep living this way. And so for about a month, I begged God to take my life. One night, as I was um, calling out to the Lord, I had a clear vision of Jesus Christ getting down on one knee. He reached his hand into the pit and he said, do you trust me? And as I thought about it for a second, I knew he was asking me to leave everything. And I said, I do. And so I took his hand and walked away from my entire life. I left my partner, I left my job, I left my um, security, my entire identity behind. It was the hardest thing I've ever done. I came home and my mom kept telling me, I th if you will be obedient to God, the feelings will follow, but you've got to put your faith in the Lord and walk by faith. As I was unpacking, the little bit of clothes I had, I'd given away almost everything, but I would sort of unpack one thing at a time and I would just sob for an hour. It was so devastating. Think about everything I'd left. I just thought, I can't handle this anymore. And the pain is just becoming too great. My mom all of a sudden brought this entire pile of cards out and set them on the table that the ladies in her Bible study had written to me. And she told me how they'd been praying for me for years and they were so excited to meet me. And as I began to open these cards, they weren't just, you know, sign their name. These ladies had written me real notes telling me about the hope that they had for their own prodigal children and how they loved and encouraged me and how they were praying for me. And I just felt so loved by these women. And then on top of that, they had raised almost $1,600 for me to buy a new wardrobe. I said, Mom, I don't even know these women. And I was just overcome by, by their love for me. One of the cards in particular is I was really struggling with, um, I can't handle the pain. It says, 
Help me to honor thee by believing before I feel, for great is the sin if I make feeling a cause of faith. That was exactly what I need to hear, that it was a great sin for me to make my feelings a cause of faith. My faith was in Christ, not in what I was feeling. If we were just made up of our feelings and our instincts and our desires, that would just make us like animals. We would be slaves to our desires. But because we're made in the image of God, we can choose our behavior no matter what we feel. And that was really radical to me. For anyone out there that is struggling this thinking, this is too painful, this is too hard. I've been there and I know what that's like. But the next morning when I showed up at mom's Bible study, all of a sudden I was surrounded by more love than I've ever felt in my life from women. And they just surrounded me with hugs and with joy. I've never seen so much joy at a sinner repenting and coming home and they were just flooding me with, with love and compassion and they were so happy for me. And in that moment, my heart was transformed. And all of a sudden, I no longer believed that I was transgender. It still took a while for God to peel away the layers. I didn't really like being a female at that moment, but I knew that I was gonna be okay. I knew that God was with me. And I knew that I had an incredible support network. So a couple of days later, we started buying female clothes and I was excited and ready to embark on this new life. And over the next couple of years, as God began to peel away the layers, begin to heal the wounds and the hurt and help me for, to forgive um, everything and to really wrestle with my own, the lies that I had believed as a child. My mom really did love me, but I just couldn't understand it. Not only did he heal our relationship, he used her to bring me to Christ. When people get tired of the lies, they don't turn to the people that lie to them turn to the people that told them the truth even when they didn't want to hear it. I had named myself Jacob, but I didn't realize until God revealed it much later that Jacob meant supplanter and deceiver. And that's exactly, Jacob had been nothing but supplanting my true identity and had been just a life of lies. But then later, once I went back to being Laura, I didn't know that Laura meant victorious spirit. I was kind of fearful about going to church, but I went in and talked to the pastor there. And I said, you know, um, I'm Laura. I used to be Walt. I'll be honest with you. I just want to know, are you going to try to change me back to Walt? And he said, no. He said, as a pastor, he said, my job is to love you. If you're going to change back to Walt, that's God's job, not mine. And so he allowed me to go to church. He allowed me to be in groups. And they had a recovery ministry there. So I was seeing counselors. And when I finally got to my fourth step, and I had all these things written down on a piece of paper about being cross-dressed and being molested, and we had gone through them. It took over two hours, one by one. We're praying about them. He's dealing with them as best we can and trying to really turn them over to the Lord and get rid of them. And so when we were done, we went outside and he put a match to the corner of the paper and let it begin to burn. The gentle breeze took the flames and the paper and they just disappeared and then he patted me on the shoulder he says okay now it's time to go pray an image came to me in that prayer and it was the Lord Jesus Christ and he was reaching down toward me and I began to look at where his hands were and there was a little baby there and I realized that that little baby was me and he grabbed the little baby and pulled it into his arms and then he turned and spoke to me and he says you are now safe with me forever. And I realized at that very moment that the Lord came to hold me and to redeem my life because he said, you are now safe with me forever. And that's where I was rescued by Jesus Christ from my transgender life. So then I began to live out my life as Walt. The Lord wants the transgender community in the church. The Lord wants them in the pews. The Lord wants them to hear the truth, that something happened to them that was horrible, and that they had every right to feel the feelings they were feeling, but the only way to really escape pain in your life is turn it over to Jesus Christ. Allow him to have the pain so that he can restore you, so that the pain goes away. and so. Church leaders need to have their arms open to them and welcome them in, but listen to their stories. 
come and understand. Understand what my dad went through in life and what others go through. Understand the real pain and the isolation that I feel. We have moms that are on antidepressants, anxiety medications, and yes, sometimes suicidal because the grief is so deep for them. You have fathers that blame themselves and the wives. This is a loss of a partner. There's so much behind the scenes, so much pain that everybody's going through. And so if the church would just understand and learn about it so that you can be equipped, so that when somebody like my dad comes in and says that I'm Becky, that you can gently talk into his life and to help to make a difference. The Lord will use us through that with friendship, with companionship, with mentoring and with counseling but we can be Jesus with skin on and let them feel loved, possibly for the first time in their life. One other objection, maybe the one that's most deeply felt, and that's how can this be fair? You know, someone who says, I have these unwanted desires, I didn't ask for them. I prayed for them to get rid of them and I still have them. How is this fair to my best friend? Uh, is this person just condemned to a life of loneliness? and? You know, my friend seems to be so happy when he's with his boyfriend and when he tries to live God's way, he seems so miserable. Why would God do that? I think so many of us are uncomfortable with the call to take up our cross. We're embarrassed because we feel like this feels like an impossible burden for others. But the answer isn't to say, you don't have a cross to pick up. The answer is to say, we all have a cross and they're different and we don't pretend they all have the same weight or feel the same, but the call for each following Christ is to lay down our lives, to die to ourselves and to follow Jesus. So if there's a person with same-sex attraction and they're looking at the Christian worldview saying, if I become a Christian, I'm condemned to no family and miserableness and pain. One of the first things I'm gonna do is just reach out and love this person as an individual. And I would actually try to talk about who Jesus is first, because once people understand who Jesus is, that he's God, that he offers a good life, and through the church and through the Holy Spirit can bring healing and a body of people who will love this individual, then the kind of healing can come. Because if this person has the perception that you're only happy if you get married and have kids, then of course Christianity is going to look painful to that person. But Jesus was single. Paul was single at least for a season. Jeremiah was single. John the Baptist was single. And they had fulfilling, significant lives through their relationships within the church. I love the Psalm that says, God brings the lonely into families. We need to be the family of God where singles can come and those struggling with same-sex attraction can come and see, yes, I have had to give something up, but I have found such rich fellowships, such rich friendships that I'm never alone. I, I have a family. This is a, a question that comes up a lot. Is it really possible that I can experience change? So there's this idea that, you know, we just need to give up because this, this thing isn't going to change for people. So what that does is that strikes right at the very heart of the gospel. Either you have a gospel conforming to godliness and is transformative in power or you're religious and you have a gospel that has no power. They deny the power of the Lord Jesus Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit to change lives. I've changed, I really have changed. I, I don't lust after men. I don't wanna have sex with men. And I'm married to a woman uh, for 32 years, going on 33 years. Now, that's not necessarily a promise that a, a particular person, let's say a gay identified man who's been living a, as a homosexual for 30 years, it would be disingenuous. It actually would be even unkind of me to tell this man that he can have a hope of total eradication of any kind of temptation. Uh, but here's the amazing thing about grace. 
where sin abounds, grace abounds more. Grace is actually this power of the, the very presence of Jesus to come to live inside of you. So the spirit of grace gives us the ability to say no to unrighteousness and to sin and to live godly. Now we know that if you continue to change your behavior over time, your neural pathways in your brain will actually change as well. And this is right in line with the scripture. It says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your body, to present your body as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto him. Therefore, in doing so, don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of the mind. And so right there in scripture, we also see that in the renewing of the mind, by yielding your body, by actually consecrating your body, your life can change. He can take an excruciating, ignominious death of his son and make it the means by which he saves the entire world. Do you need any greater demonstration of his love? Because you have that great demonstration, you can give up having to control your own life and allow my son living in you through the Holy Spirit to be the primary controlling influence in your life. Because God is actually strong enough, wise enough, loving enough, and merciful enough to take that innate urge that we didn't ask to have and use it as a means of shaping Christ in us. If you are struggling with your sexuality and your gender identity, it is worth the struggle to do things God's way and to try and honor God in that. And yet all of Christian life is a struggle. Obeying God is a struggle. Holiness is a struggle. The fact that there's a struggle doesn't mean that you're on the wrong path. The fact that it's hard doesn't mean that you should give up. The fact that it doesn't feel right doesn't mean that you put your feelings above the Word of God and say, well, I'm gonna go with my feelings instead of what God says. Because it's when we feel like we are at our wit's end and can't help ourselves, when we feel like we're at a loss for what to be able to do, that we become candidates for opening ourselves up to experience the power of God. So when people say, I'm born this way, okay, well, even if you're born this way, you need to be born again. You need to be born again, and you need to have the power of the grace of God in your life that gives you the ability to rise above it. And Jesus said, these are the ones who enter into my kingdom. They are the overcomers. They keep overcoming and overcoming, not the ones who stay in sin and darkness. That's why confession is so important. That's why living a life of accountability is absolutely imperative and having boundaries and a safe place to develop a true, sincere Christian life. And you wanna tell people, God's word really works. It really works. And that's what I have found in ministry and ministering to men is they really do get free. How many of you have been touched by the grace of God? Your life changed. God's design is amazing, and it is, it is meant not only for His glory, but for our good. And when we step into who He created us to be, we begin to flourish. And I am much better off. I am more whole, more joyful. I am more settled in my identity than I ever could have been if I was pulling away from God's design. I think if every person knew of the importance of their true identity and the life that God had for them, it would be life-changing. Can I just tell you, there is hope for you. God loves you, and you are made in the image of God. You're made in the image of God. Do you realize that God created you in your mother's womb? That he knew his plans for you? that he wants joy for you and peace. You know, it's never too late to be redeemed and restored by Jesus Christ. It's never, ever too late. You're never too old and it's never too late. 
put yourself in front of Jesus Christ. Admit you're wrong. Turn your life over to him and allow him to transform you back to who he made you to be. And you will never have a better life than that. I can guarantee you that. Okay, <laughs> so many buttons to click here. Um, what? Let me just start. Um, what did you hear in those in those testimonies that was uh, significant to you? What did what caught your attention from uh, the young lady and the gentleman who who shared their testimonies? Well, they're affected greatly by the love of other people, the Holy Spirit, regardless of what the people did, the Holy Spirit was very active in their lives. So it didn't take a person to condemn them and judge them. Uh, they went through the struggle of responding and working through the difficulty to align themselves with Christ. And they now have an apparent joy and ability to help others. I, th I think uh, it's not really necessarily true, but I, <clears throat> I think there's a couple of components. Uh, one is a miraculous power that, that God provides, the power of God through the Holy Spirit to make this change. But it's not always just us who are part of the situation. It's not just us sitting back and watching that happen. It's also us being involved along with this power. Our love is part of that process of change. So there's, there's those two things that we need to keep in mind. Not, it's not a, oh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to love this person into changing. And it's also not, I'm just going to sit back and let God change him. It's both. And we have to be willing to, you know, whether we face this situation or not, be a participant with God. He's chosen to make us part of the job on that. So thanks, Larry. Anything else? To be honest, I stepped out. I had to talk to Kay for a few minutes, but um, the one thing right when I um, started listening again is um, they talked at the end about um, how being accountable to somebody is important. Um, I, that has been said, I've heard that over and over again forever, but I've written, that's something that's really, um, standing out to me right now. I think, um, as Christians, a lot of times we, we feel like that's not, we feel like that's a bad thing. Um, like we feel like we have to be accountable to somebody. And I, I feel like that's, um, something that maybe Billy and I need to look into with having another couple to be accountable to, because I think it's really important. Um, even just in everyday, just in life, I think it's important. And so that's something that stood out to me. I think being accountable to people is very important. I, I, I think I'm thinking, and it may be extra to your point, but we, we, uh, you said this, Stacy. We we think being accountable is like 
uh, a chore or, oh my goodness, I've got to be accountable. You know, I get that. I don't really want to, but the Bible says I need to do this, so I'm going to do this. And, and so we go at it with that attitude. I'm going to, I'm going to be accountable and blah, 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 blah. But, but take that and apply it to anything that the Bible says to do. Yeah. We, the, the problem is we make it a chore. Uh, don't, what am I I'm trying to think of an example? Okay. Well, don't, don't use bad language. Okay, so I'm going to make myself stop using bad language or telling bad jokes or gossiping or whatever it might be. So we make it some big thing that we have to do. the The point I'm, I'm <laughs> the point is, God wants to change us. That's why we're born again. That's why right. we renew our minds. That's why we turn to him. That's why we pray. He wants to do the changing so that our attitude isn't, oh, I've got to do this to be a good boy, to I'm just going to do it. I just don't even think about it. I do it because I'm a changed person. But we, right. we push God away and say, I'm going to, I'm going to do this myself. And the Bible says, if you do it yourself, you're going to take all the credit for it. And you don't get any credit for it. And that, so anyway, we get into this cycle where we're, where we're deciding, I'm going to do this religion myself. When the whole time it's offered as, let me change you to be what you need to be to be joyful and fulfilled and abundant life. And let me do it. Step out of the way and let me do it. So anyway, I thought that when you said be accountable, you know, because I'm uh, uh, for years, I did the same thing. And now uh, the, the other thing too, now we're in this one things that the devil uh, uses and has made such a dilemma is this pandemic. So, you know, where do we, how can we be accountable? How do we do these kind of things that we know we need to be that, and God has changed us to do. And yet I've got to do it differently than I used to do it. How do I figure that out? How do I, and I can't do it and I'm not doing it. So now, here I am stuck all by myself. Same kind of idea with uh, this, this, uh, these folks that gave their testimony, you know. What am I going to do when I give up this disobedient lifestyle and do what I'm supposed to do? They're kind of worried about that. You know, am I going to, am I going to get married? Am I going to be lonely? They talked about that toward the end of the video. That's the devil, you know, making excuses, throwing in that subtle thing when we are not depending on God to give us whatever it is we might need in gender identity and sexuality and appetite and drug addiction, whatever it might be. Uh, We've got to depend on him to give what we need. Anything else that you heard that? um... Uh, So I had a few things stand out to me. Um, I don't have to go through all of them in order right now, but um, you kind of touched on it a little bit, Bobby, the, the pastor talking at the end, talking about how to, to promise someone that they'll have a certain lifestyle if only they'll get over their problems is, is I think, yeah, a very unkind deception. You hope that for them. And maybe even if, if someone's telling that they'll say, well, maybe, and they'll kind of be vague about it, but the, the implication is there. It's just like, it's not get rid of your homosexuality and all of a sudden you're going to have a big happy family 
um, you know, a, a wife or, or husband or, or it's, you know, it's, it's something that could be a cross to bear like the other guy was talking about. And I thought that was a really good point is that it's not that this needs to be singled out as a major issue. It's that all of us have crosses to bear of different sizes and different shapes. And I think that Christians as a whole need to uh, approach that attitude a little bit more because it's not, these are the really bad sins, you know, the other sins aren't as bad. Like it's still a cross. And just because, you know, your brother or sister may be struggling with something that you don't know or don't have firsthand experience with, like it's, they're not worse because of it. And, or we are not worse because we have a certain kind. It's, it's one of those things, like, it's not that being a homosexual is horrible. It's that living apart from God is horrible, whatever shape that may take. And that's really, I think, something that gets passed over, or it's just a little asterisk at the bottom of the page. It's like, yeah, you know, all sin is bad, but we're going to focus on this one more than other things. It's like, you know, and also I'm not trying to excuse it either. It's just one of those, it's all equally terrible and we all need to help each other carry whatever we happen to be struggling with in our life. Um, the, the subject is, uh, I keep, it keeps occurring to me. I've mentioned it a couple of times, but the subject, this mm-hmm. sexuality in his image, this thing we're studying it is uh, these principles are are applicable to anything, just like you were saying, Brian. They're they're true, no matter what the problem is. We just happen to be talking about sexuality right now, but it's also true for cussing. <laughs> it's also true for drug addiction. It's also true for driving too fast. You know, it, it's it's always applicable. And, and the, the other thing uh, that you said, I think that we're sometimes guilty of, we may be, is we overpromise. And I, I would say the wise thing as, as, I don't know, I guess it's kind of vague, but the only thing we can promise somebody is that whatever happens, God will take care of that. It, you know, if, if a person is facing this decision to be obedient or not, and, and we want to say, oh, well, if you'll be obedient, you're going to get a million dollars. You know, all you got to do is be obedient. No, that's, that's not true. Maybe they will, but you can't tell them that. What you can do is say, even if you have zero dollars, you're going to be cared for. God cares what happens to you. That's that's the uh, there's more to it, but that's the main thing. That's the only thing we can promise somebody. We don't know what it's going to look like necessarily, uh, but we can we can know that that is the case. That's promised in the Word um, over and over and over. God will take care of whatever it is. What else? Uh, the other thing that jumped out at me was um, maybe a good topic of conversation for us is when when the older gentleman who who used to be transgender, he was talking about meeting with the pastor and he's like, I'm Laura, but I used to be Wade or whatever his, his name was. I don't remember. Yeah. You know, is that a problem? Are you going to try and turn me back into Wade? And I thought what the pastor said was, was very good. And that's kind of how the approach I take to situations like this is like, it's not my job to change you. It's God's job to change you. It's my job to love you. Um, and I, th- I think that's the truth, but the, the thing that I kind of go back and forth on is, does that mean it's being condoned, right? You have a person in this church that's transgender you know, how, how is that person being treated? Are they being told that what they're doing is wrong? You know, in love, probably yes, but they're not told they can't show up in women's clothing. 
you know, like, I feel like that's a, that's quite a minefield to navigate. And I'm glad I don't, I'm not in charge of a church that has to figure that out. But, you know, if you had a friend that was transgender, are you going to call them by their preferred pronouns or their, their born pronouns? I liked what the mom said is like, I never used like gender specific pronouns. She just called her honey. And so I thought that was great because yeah. it's like you're not condoning it but you're not fire and brimstoning them at the same time it's just it's like yeah switzerland almost yeah that's a good point it, it it is hard uh that's one of the things uh frankly that i face um as kind of a kind of a lead decision maker for our group. And I don't, I don't face it in, in this situation. I never had, had to face, well, you can't cross dress or you can't do this. But uh, all the time I, I have to face, and, and you do too, you may not have to decide, but we all have to face uh, difference of opinion about what the truth is. Uh, I can't think of a good example, but it but it happens all the time. Uh, there's always that that pressure to decide. Well, okay, here, here I just thought of something. Uh, when we gather again, we talked about this at a board meeting a while back. Uh, when we gather again, should we wear a mask? Somebody's got to decide that. Yes or no. What's there's reasons to do, there's reasons to not. But somebody has to say, this is what's going to happen. That's maybe a poor example, but the you know, if somebody comes in, they're a man uh uh, who thinks there's a, they're a woman, they're cross-dressing, are we going to have to say that? Am I going to have to say something to them? Is, what's the rule? What's the, where's the dividing line? So that kind of thing goes on uh, all the time to, to a small degree up to a large degree. Um, and, and you're right, it is a minefield, right? Uh, it's almost like every situation has to be handled uh, differently and you would hope it would be done wisely and lovingly and biblically, <laughs> truthfully. Uh, that, that's not always the case because I'm broken, you're broken. It gets in the way, <laughs> so to speak. So uh, we, we struggle with that, but I think we say this too, you know, present the truth in a loving way, present the truth in love. Let's just take the example. If a, if a transgender person comes and they're a man, but they want to dress like a woman and come to a, a group meeting of some kind church, I would I would think we would have to say to that person, this is inappropriate. We love you. We want you to come. But this is very distracting, very difficult for us. It's a problem for the rest of us. And respectfully, we need you not to do that. That's, for example. Uh, I don't know if I necessarily agree with that. I get where you're coming from, but again, just like having right. conversations right? back and forth. Um, and Brian, were actually, Brian and I were actually talking about this on the sidelines while we were listening to you and stuff. And um, and I could be wrong, but I almost see it as like if someone who's transgender and dresses as such were to come into like 122 or a church, like a church setting, I don't know if it would necessarily be needed to 
draw attention to that individual, like specifically call them out, potentially embarrass them, give them the spotlight or whatever. Like they already know that they're different and that they're standing out and stuff like that. Um, and I think if we were to just like, hey, you're new, what, what's your name? Because it, it's not that hard to figure out in all honesty. Um, and then just treat them like an individual and a person and then keep doing what we believe is right. Keep going down the path that we believe is true and teaching God's word and that Jesus loves you and all this stuff. Because um, I also liked what that pastor said about, well, maybe like if you think you're born this way, then you still need to be reborn. And so like you could argue that. Um, path you know it's like okay well if they if they genuinely think that they were born this way that they were a, a man but identify as a woman well then it's not our job to convince them otherwise it's our job to love them and to teach the truth which in there lies the conflict because the truth of what god says and who jesus is goes directly against their lifestyle so there's your conflict and that's going to be uncomfortable enough for them in general we don't i think just bringing it drawing attention to it right out of the gate might not be necessary if that makes sense yeah so i, I think that they already view churches or christians as unwelcoming already yeah and so even if that's not how that conversation would go it may be perceived that way you know they they're driven to these communities that accept them wholeheartedly and unconditionally because that's appealing and so I think that until someone develops a one-on-one -on -one personal relationship with that hypothetical person that is going to come in then it probably just I don't know I don't want to say ignored but it should it shouldn't be yeah like don't draw a t like yeah. it's the elephant in the room we everybody's going to get that and then should that individual start acting out or um, being more quote unquote extreme and then causing that level of discomfort saying uh, what we're preaching is wrong or hateful or non-inclusive, then that's an opportunity to approach that person and have that one-on-one -on -one conversation about, hey, you know, this is what we believe. This is what you believe. Like, you know, this might not be a good fit or whatever that might look like, but um, let's let's figure out the truth together and yeah type of a situation Bible. What does the Bible say? you know just take them point them back and then if they choose not to then they can leave like yeah, i don't it's, it's i don't know virtual. yeah one thing i think perspective wise we were thinking differently i was thinking about uh more like somebody that'd been there several times so oh, okay. time was part of the factor not the first time they walked in the door oh no we're not going to let you come here no I didn't, I wasn't thinking like that. I can see the difference. The yeah. other thing is you said, I think is very key. Tell them, you said, tell them the truth. Confront them with the truth. Tell them in love. What does that look like? Yeah. That's, that's the question. That's the dilemma for us. When do you, when does, uh, ignoring it become tolerance and become a bad thing. We need to confront them with the truth. Uh, but we need to love them too. Wow. That, I don't know. I don't have an answer for that. And I think we also uh, need to realize it's not going to be a night and day transformation. It's not, you know, oh, take this sure. magical pill and you're going to lose 50 pounds in two weeks. Like, no, it's not that. I mean, I, I really feel like that we discount as Christians the power of seed planting, that we need to sit and just be okay with planting seeds. That's fine. It's somebody else's job to water and cultivate and trim and all that, you know, fancy stuff that makes for great testimony. And honestly, who doesn't want to be involved in some transformative testimony of somebody? But just the fact that you're planting seeds you're sticking to what is true building relationships i think that's all you can really ask for and then just be in deliberate 
serious prayer about how are we supposed to address this individual? How are we supposed to build constructive relationships while still speaking the truth in love and making them feel like they're an individual and not a sin? You know, and I, I just think it's like, I, yeah, I don't think there is a black and white answer for that. And it's, you know, God can do all things. And I think it's just going to be, like you said, like a case by case basis. But I mean, yeah, like the Wade guy, the testimony. No, no, it sounded, just a minute. Go ahead. Go ahead, Brian. It sounded like his kind of transformation only came about after being involved in a small group and confronting those deeper issues of his abuse and his, <clears throat> you know, or abuse of many varieties and his grandmother and like confronting all those deeper issues, like, how he acted on the surface didn't change until God got a hold of those other problems. Mm -hmm. It's not, you know, if a guy likes to dress up as a girl, all he has to do is just start dressing up like a guy again and the problems fix. It's like, it's, that's a symptom of a deeper problem. Yeah. Well, and, and I think too, you know, how do you treat someone like that different than anybody else? I'll give you two examples. I, I have a brother-in-law who claimed he had a relationship, well, actually two brother-in-laws that claimed they had a relationship with God, but there's no evidence of it at all. Well, we don't go to church together, but I'm still me and I still hold my values when I'm with them and they know what I believe and they know I'm not judging them, trying to make them change. So, because, I mean, I have talked to them about it, but it's like, I'm not going to convince them. Now, may God may take something I say and apply his Holy Spirit to their heart. I don't know. And another example is Dick's going to have uh, uh, two ladies that are gay who we uh, met with for dinner and social things many times. In fact, I met with a, a couple of weeks ago. I live in Carrollton now. I went up and met with them and so forth. Same kind of thing there. You know, I don't, I'm developing a relationship with them. We don't go to uh, church together, but they know what my position is. And uh, I'm not trying to change them. God's changing them or going to change them or wants to change them. And right now, one of them has a serious health problem and may die. And, you know, what a more perfect time for God maybe to show up in her life to help transform her. So, you know, by just loving you know, giving and receiving love is probably the greatest thing that we can do in life in the name of Christ and let God do his work. I'm not saying we shouldn't confront, maybe we should correct somewhere, but I mean, that is not the teaching of Christ, really. I mean, he told us to be bold. He told us to, you know, be truthful. And so, but the overriding thing was the love. Mm -hmm. Paul talked a lot about it love one another, be there for them. And I think, you know, what Brian said is really so, so true. We're not going to say something if somebody, you know, maybe dressing like a man one day and, and a woman the next. And so their problem is fixed. That, that just isn't the case that, you know, in the same thing with anything else going on, we can't change it. Only God can. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I think about when, when the, the man who witnessed to me at work years ago kept witnessing and I didn't, I can't tell you a thing he said, all I know he kept talking about something called mercy and grace and I didn't know what it meant. He invited me to church. Uh, you know, the Holy Spirit touched my heart for about three or four Sundays in a row until I said, I give up, Lord, here I am, you know. So it wasn't anything that a man said other than it got me there. It didn't even really get me to thinking so much. It was God started working in my heart. Maybe it was because Jeff showed up. Maybe it wasn't. I can't tell you that. But he invited me to church, and that's where I felt the Holy Spirit. Yeah, Jesus confronted people sometimes. Other times, he sat down and ate with them. Other times, he healed them. Other times, like, he, he approached lost people a whole bunch of different ways and he would he knows which way each person needs so we need to just be listening to know how to approach anybody regardless of what we see on the surface you know walking into our 
church or whatever. I think uh, uh, the thought that comes to me is is that uh, culturally, the the mantra is the uh, tolerance, and so we we've, we've lost confrontation, the art of confrontation, loving confrontation, and presenting the truth. We've kind of given up on that in, in uh, accepted society's uh, mantra again of tolerance. I want us to be careful about that, not ugly about it, not always confrontational, not whatever, you know, there's a there's that fine line, so to speak. There's that place where that's where that's to be done, but it, you don't you don't never do it, and you don't always do it. There's something in the middle, <laughs> somewhere to bring truth lovingly and do the job. So, Bobby, sure. I think the key. I think. It just keeps coming back to me. The I think the main thing here is that we need to be praying for you because you are the leader of our group and the spirit is going to lead you. And it's what the spirit says, not what not what anybody else feels, or it's where the spirit leads you. And so us praying for you is the key to that, I believe. Thank you. I I, I forget that sometimes. And I think it's all up to me because <laughs> I'm a human being, <laughs> but, but I know better. And, and I've, at least up until now, I've always come back to that point. Like I was telling you a while ago, I, I know better than to uh, worry about it. It's kind of this, this moving, getting back together thing. It's been on my mind for several months. Some days it becomes a big deal. Other days I don't know relax. It's okay. God's got this. He's always had it my whole life. Even when I fretted over anything, he took care of it and he's going through this time. So thank you, Stacy. I appreciate yeah. that really. Yeah. Well, uh, and but, another thing too, another thing too, is I look at it kind of in a weird, <laughs> in a different way. Um, I, to me, that's just the, uh, uh all, what we were talking about is just one of the sin. Like, I mean, my one of my big sins I eat too much. I mean, are is somebody going to come to me at church and say, "Hey, when are you going to take control of your weight?" <laughs> you know, I mean, it's just one of our sins, and I, they're all the same to God. And so, I don't know. It's kind of it's weird because you, it's hard to. I don't know. It's hard. I think too, the same thing you're talking about. I'm an overeater. So I think I, I eat too much. What gives me the right to say anything about somebody else? Anything. Right. Guess, I'm, just, I'm just as bad as, I'm worse or as bad as anybody. And, and let me yeah. say quickly one more thing. This is, um, it's on the subject, but it's off of the gender identity. We, we did have uh, a fellow come one time when we were meeting several years ago that I had to confront with, with his behavior. He was misbehaving in a, in a, well, I don't want to go too much into it, but he was misbehaving to our group. And I had to confront him with that. And I had to ask him not to come again. And he, he begged me otherwise. He came back and begged me otherwise. And I had to, I had to say no, uh, because I knew I was behaving. But anyway, I, I just, as an example, that, that kind of thing goes on. And, and uh, uh, I'm in that position where, you know, I'm, I'm up with this. You face you face these kind of things too, whether it's on this scale or not, or with other people involved or not. But uh, not nothing great about me. But uh, it's there, and and it is for all of us, and we have to uh, deal with that every day. Discern 
what's right. Uh, let me ask you this: Do you do you think, or how is I, I think it is, but do you agree that the idea of quote change is possible is uh, is out there is a thing to to us and to other people? What, what importance is that? Does it, is it even real and does it matter? And uh, let's talk about that a little bit. I'm, I'm, I'm curious if you're that person with confusion and do you have to believe change is possible in order for you to even start uh, the step toward God? Well, yeah, I mean, I feel like that's kind of a big deal. And because I mean, even if you were to take change away, if you're in that um, like confused state, but you're getting where like, you know, you're trying to figure out the difference between how you're feeling emotionally as far as your gender identity and what um like that women's group was just pouring out all that love to that lady you know if you're like in that transitionary period it's you know like me I don't know but I, I don't see how you could not believe that change is possible if you're seeing people get so excited over you who feels like used goods like that lady described herself as as just being so excited to see you and loving on you like I just I don't see how you couldn't believe change is attainable well, because I'm, these I'm crazy people it, believe it. <laughs> I'm thinking about there are there are churches. Uh, in, I can't think of one that I know of. Well, I'll, I'll take it back, uh, and I can't remember the name of it, but. Uh, I was, I was, uh, year before last, I was contemplating uh, going to a convention um, that was held at a church that was embracing, and they said, I looked at their website, and I know this, but it was a, it was a big deal to them that they were very rainbow oriented. Everybody's loved, everybody's accepted, everybody's wanted. Now, I don't know if that meant uh, we're going to love you into the, the kingdom, but I took it to mean that they were saying, you're just as good as the rest of us if you're gay and call yourself a Christian, like we talked about the first week. So there is there is an acceptance or a tolerance of, I'm gay or I'm transgender, but I'm also a Christian. So they don't I, believe change is possible. They don't accept that. That's what I'm thinking about. Oh, I think uh, they're delusional then. <laughs> okay, well, you have to, I, I think to me, you have to say in the back of your mind or front of your mind or whatever, it is possible for me to change. There is reason for me to change. Actually, I'll take they that have statement back. Scripture that says this is wrong. You must do something different. So I'm sorry. Go ahead. Oh, you're good. No, no, no. Um, not so much that they're delusional. Um, but I think I wouldn't be surprised if it's just the fact that nobody, like you said, we lost the art of loving confrontation. Nobody wants to have the real talks, the uncomfortable talks. Nobody wants to make anybody uncomfortable or mad or hurt their feelings you know regardless if it's you know it's going to be better for them in the long run if it's something that's going to make their life have meaning and fulfillment you know so churches that are like yeah we totally support um the gay community i think is more detrimental to the gay community than if they never got into the church at all personally because then they're someone like they're they're holding the truth the churches that support the gay community are holding on to a truth that is so life 
altering in, a, in the most positive way possible. It's just revolutionizing. They're holding it on to their, them, them for themselves being greedy and not having those real talks to share that same truth with these people that don't understand. So it's like they're lying to them. I, I think back to this confrontation thing, I, I just thought of this too. There, there are at least three categories of, of sin that we formulated. Uh, obviously, that's not true. Sin is sin. But we formulated three different categories that I see. One is, here's a, here's a let's say, a guy comes to church. He's just murdered somebody. You know it. He knows it. You're going to confront him with what he's done wrong. Well, I, under, let's tell him he's that. He comes to <laughs> church drunk. He, he comes <laughs> drunk. You're going to confront that person and say, getting drunk and coming to church is not okay. You know, you're more likely to do that. You're not going to let that go. You're not going to ignore that. If, if they're being drunk and disruptive and whatever, or they're taking drugs or what, you're going to confront that. All right. Then there's the, the category that we ignore our categories. We ignore overeating. <laughs> we ignore it. Nobody, nobody's going to confront that. Nobody is going to come to me and say, you need to control your weight. Nobody's going to do that. If I came drunk, they're going to jump on me. If I came overweight, they're not going to say anything. And then there's the category that says this is wrong what you're doing is wrong it's unbiblical which makes it wrong but we don't know whether we want to confront this or not you see what i'm saying so we have confront eh, society says don't confront and then and then the last thing that we we don't even think about so that's that was just something that came to my mind that to here me, we are being influenced by that. Go ahead, Stacey. To me, it's the I mean, the ones that you're confronting, it's because they're they're disruptive. If they're not messing with nobody else, if they're like, if if then that's then like you can't do anything. But if they're disruptive, then that's something you have to immediately take care of. But if Why? they're to themselves, then they're take and they're then I mean, you know, that, like, that's what I, mean. I, so, so, so. I agree. I agree. That's what we do. But is that right? No, I that, don't think. Doesn't, so. it say, doesn't scripture say here's right, here's wrong? There, there's a black and white. Whether it's uh, confrontable, maybe not, maybe so, ignorable. All of them are the same. They, Again, they I think it's where the spirit leads. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I mean, I think I that our primary purpose is to spread the word of God and to tell people the truth. Now, um, when we each are in church, we are all fallen people. We all have issues like y'all have already mentioned. Now, I walk in. Uh, when I was in my drug addiction, just an example of a church that I grew up in, and I was told I wasn't welcome there, and um, that didn't do me any good, you know, that didn't point me towards the Bible and learning what was in it and how to be obedient to the Lord mm -hmm. and how to not do what I was doing that was killing me, and um, so I, I think it's real important. You know, I think like I agree with Stacy pretty much that the spirit needs to be in charge because when you get the flesh in there and then this person over here thinks that sin is worse than their sin, it's not that's not God working. You know, that's causing dissension. I mean, God is not an author of confusion, right? So, I mean, when we're gathering as friends, that's it we're friends 
brothers and sisters in Christ sin to me. The stuff that I've done in the past, if, and that's where it comes in, where your testimony is important, how God miraculously changes people. That's where our stories come in and you share what's in the Bible and how God has changed you. Then once this person has been changed by the Holy Spirit, then they see the power they have to become different and be obedient. But you don't just walk in and, and you don't just automatically know how to do that. You have to be taught, you know. And even though I grew you. up like in uh, reading, you know, grew up learning about the Bible, you you have to be able to receive it. Yeah. You know, you have to be a, at a place that you can receive change. Yeah. Let me let me give you an example. I just thought of this. I I heard this 20 years ago, uh, and I can't remember the name of the church. The pastor is Jim Simbola. It's in New York City. Uh, he's author and pastor. You you probably heard him before. I can't I can't remember the name of the church. Anyway, they have it's a it's a huge church. They're in New York City. They have several services on Sunday. They have they, people come in, go out. Another crowd comes in, goes out. Another crowd. They do that like four or five times. But here's my point. They, they are in inner city New York. They are in a neighborhood where there's drug addiction, drunkenness, prostitution, all kinds of things that good people would <laughs> condemn as wrong, okay? Among other things that we would ignore that are wrong, but there are those things that go on. But what they do is these people will come into church drunk or high or, you know, homeless, whatever it might be. They have people who meet them if somebody is, you, you can tell they're disruptive to the group for some reason, drunk or high or whatever it might be, or they're not dressed right or what, you know. They have people who find those people and go to them and either sit with them or take them to a, they have a room where they can put people that are disruptive to the service. Yeah. Brooklyn Tabernacle, I'm trying to, that's the name of the church, Brooklyn Tabernacle, okay? But they've got people that that go and, and find these people and deal with this thing. They love them, but they don't, they don't go to them and say, oh, you can't come here, or you've got to go away, or... Uh, you're not welcome here or whatever it might be. They don't do that. They, they instead say, we're glad you're here and I'm going to, I'm going to make sure of it. I'm personally going to make sure of it. So anyway, I just wanted to, I thought uh, that's a great situation. I love that, that they do that and a, a good example for the rest of us. Sorry. That is a good idea. Yeah. That's pretty much what I was trying to say. You know, I yeah, mean, yeah. don't don't turn people away just because of what they look like on the outside because somebody might be so much dirtier on the inside sitting there and you don't even know or whatever. So all yeah. that's a good idea. What I mean, I just uh, don't I think do it's beneficial. To... I don't think it's beneficial to put more shame on the person walking in that probably yeah. has enough already. Absolutely. Absolutely I mean, you could not. get more hypocritical than that, truth be told. Yeah. So, sometimes, I guess, again, the, the responses run the gamut and the, the appropriate responses run the gamut. Sometimes you would just have to say, you can't, you can't. That would be the loving answer. Go away. Uh, mo rarely. 
most of the time it would be something else or uh, whatever it might be. But uh, anyway, back to what, what we're talking about, how, how would we respond to that? Now, uh, let's go on beyond that. Let's say we are responding. Uh, we, have, we have been loving. We have been, uh, I'll say, tolerant to a degree, uh, knowing the truth still exists. There's a standard of truth. And uh, let me let me read this to you. They they uh, a guy used it in the video. Romans 12, 1 to 2. Therefore, brothers and sisters, in view of the mercies of God, I urge you to present your bodies as a living sacrifice. Your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true worship. Do not be conformed to this age, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may discern what is the good, pleasing, and perfect will of God. There's so many things in that, those two verses that are, that are truths for us and not just a transgender or homosexual person, but for us <laughs> too, uh, who are different sexually or whatever it might be. But uh, this is this the idea that this is offered to us. There is a renewing opportunity. There is a born again opportunity. There is a transforming opportunity. There is power offered to be able to do that. But it has to be a presentation of ourselves, our bodies, to this power, God, in order to be renewed. So um, if, if, you're, if there's a person who is confused or trapped, Let's, let's say they feel trapped. They, they know there's something wrong. They're miserable. They're perceiving that this is a bad lifestyle. They're in this situation, but they feel like they can't change. They're, they're trapped in this thing. How can this verse uh, be used to convince them otherwise, to, to push them off a dime, so to speak? Well, you, you, um, I was going to kind of say this a while ago. I think it's important, you know, um, that they know change is even possible from maybe they're not able to even, you know, when I was a month clean and sober, there's no way I could have read a Bible or even listened to an audio or anything and got anything out of it. But if somebody would have sat with me as a Christian, as a sister in Christ, and told me, this is how I got through it, and this is what the Bible says, and we can look it up together when you can understand that, and that exactly. change is possible. That's what that says to me. If you obey and you remember that the Holy Spirit, that your body is a temple, and that the Holy Spirit is in this place, the simple, your body. Therefore, to me, I'm, I'm supposed to take care of it. And yes, I have fallen short, you know. And but also, there's been some restoration from the Lord in 30 years of not doing the same thing, of learning how to be obedient slowly but surely. The process, mm -hmm. right? So. You could, you could, and the key there, Jennifer, and for all of us, is uh, I will go with you. I will walk with you. I will hold your hand. I will holler at you. I will hug you. I will do what's needed 
to take you through this, to go with you through this process. That's what a Christian is. Mm -hmm. That's what a Christ follower is. It's not someone who preaches or who stands on a corner and does this. What? That's part of it. But uh, a real Christian is someone who lives a loving life toward another person or other people or whatever it might be. What I'm thinking is I might, I might come to you, uh, form this relationship, as Larry said, and that can be done over a hundred years time. It can go, it can take a second in mm -hmm. anything in between. But I can go to you and I can share this verse, maybe. Maybe that's what I do. I read this verse to you. And like you said, Jennifer, uh, if I just got clean and sober, doesn't make any sense. Mm -hmm. But then I go back to it in a month or two or three and read it again. And it's like, oh, it's something else. And then I go back to it again in a month or two or three and read it again. And it's oh, something else. So the process is going on. But what what is the problem is we never start the process. We never are agents of what we're called to do. We, re we refuse to obey the call, I'm afraid. And uh, maybe I'm just talking to myself, but I, I, I think that is generally true. And that's why we sit around and holler each other about not doing what we should do uh, and gripe about it. And we're seeing the consequences of that in, in uh, all, the, all the problems that we face and talk about. I just think it's why, important why? to remember um, to meet people where they are, to meet people. I, I had the, the people that helped me um, grow or whatever and stop the behavior that was more than one behavior and the sin that was killing me were the ones that met me where I was at and taught me how to grow, like you're saying, not the ones that, you know, acted like I was helpless case, you know. I just think we ought we should offer hope because the Holy Spirit is hope and peace. And all that, that, you know. That that leads to the next question. It's kind of part of that. But why why would it be important for Christians who do not struggle with LBGTQ issues? Just we we don't have a problem with it. Why would it be important for us to share our testimonies? with those people, uh, is it important and why would it be? I think it is important. And even if our testimony wasn't about sexual identity or gender identity or whatever, it's still a story of overcoming. I overcame this obstacle, not by, just by myself, but with the help of Jesus and with the help of close friends that, like Jennifer was saying, met me where I was at and loved me and supported me and told me what I needed to hear, regardless if I wanted to hear it or not. And so it's the same story over and over and over again, but just with different flavors, if you will. So yeah, I totally agree. And I think that sharing your testimony is very important whenever you're meeting somebody who's struggling in a different capacity compared to what you were struggling or are currently struggling in. Again, whatever the whatever the uh, sin or disobedience is, let's say uh, whatever, I, I'm I'm stuck in this sin. I'm stuck in this disobedience. I'm, I'm a guy that's doing something wrong. 
I'm living a, a lifestyle that's wrong. What is the likelihood that I'm going to pick up a Bible and read the truth versus you coming to me and <laughs> being a Bible, living it, talking about it, sharing it, telling your story? How much, how much bigger an impact would that have versus picking up a word and reading it? I mean, I think the answer is obvious. So we need to be uh, not intimidated or afraid or uncaring or whatever it might be. We don't need to be that way. We need to tell our story, no matter whether or not we think it's important or not. People need to hear what we have to say. And, uh, you know, I may have dealt with a different problem. I may not have homosexuality or sexual issues, but there is a problem I had to deal with or am dealing with or whatever that I can share about that may open the door to some other issue. So that's the way I feel about it. Again, just being open to what the spirit leads you to. Um, he's going to show you what we need to do and, and when we need to say it. And in, in, in that vein, Stacey, that's right. And so we need to listen. We need to listen to the spirit. He may be telling us. Uh, we may even say, Holy Spirit, tell me what to do. But until we open our ears and hear him, <laughs> we're not going to know the answer. You know what I'm, you know what I'm saying? So yeah. uh, let's be open to the spirit, but let's do what he says. Let's listen to what he says. Let's obey. Uh, there's, there's several steps to that. I agree with that. A lot of uh, same sex strugglers fear that a life of obedience to God will require them to be single and lonely. Uh, let me look up this passage. Psalm 68. <clears throat> oh. I'll get there eventually. Psalm. Well, that's weird. There. Psalm sixty eight. Six. God provides homes for those who are deserted. He leads out the prisoners to prosperity, but the rebellious live in a scorched land. This kind of goes back to, we don't know exactly what God has for a, a person, for us or for anybody else. But we do know that it's good. It is ultimately God promises good things. And so we can promise that. Not particular things, but generally speaking, good things, prosperous things. Why is it important for the body of Christ to be the family of God to those who are called to singleness? It's kind of the, the last thing they ended up with. This is a little different subject, but uh, again, you could make this applicable to many things. 
why why is it important that we be the family of God? Because we we need support. We need to hear other things from the Lord besides what's in our own head. Well, I mean, we don't need to be alone. Just, you know, the devil likes that a lot. <laughs> You know, when you're in groups, you're always stronger and always more able to defeat Satan, for one thing. Amen. And we bring different experiences and perspectives to the table. It's not just one, one, one perspective, one life experience and like you just go about your business no it's like we come from all different walks of life and like jennifer like it's just like it's a nice melting pot almost like if you're struggling with something there's like uh crystal uh talks about this a lot like there's a bunch of like there's always an older woman that's gone through the a lot of the same life experience like a younger woman is going through and it's like go talk to her and see what she did and how she got through this and so it's just it's a it's a place that you can learn from other people's mistakes and grow stronger in your faith at a younger age compared to the generation before you and it's just that same trickle down effect it just it, it makes you it should make you make everybody stronger and wiser and all that stuff i i have a thought <clears throat> I have, this is just me, I have never, that I remember, and I think I would remember, but I have never received a hug from Jesus personally. I, I never have. I've never seen him, uh, have it. Yeah. I haven't experienced that. However, I have uncountable times received a hug from a Jesus follower. Mm -hmm. Amen. Never, never met the man physically, personally. Never got a hug, but I've met a, a hundred thousand of people who claim it. That is how we receive the love that Jesus promised us, that God promised us. He uses his followers to deliver what that that thing is that's where we get it so if we stay away run away hide don't go ignore whatever whatever if we don't become a part of that family or we don't be that family then we're never going to get a hug and the person who is struggling with sexuality, struggling with drug addiction, struggling with overeating, struggling with whatever, they're never going to know, they're never going to know, feel that love unless I personally deliver it or you personally deliver it. That's why we need to be family. That's why we need each other. We can't, all those other things we said, uh, we share ideas, we share stories, we share grief, we share joy. All those things are good, but we deliver from God to each other what he, he gives us. That's how we get it the vast majority of the time. So uh, we got to remember that. I've got to remember that. 
And it's, it's easy uh, to say, oh, well, I'm a, my personality is uh, to be alone or to not, nah, I don't want to hug. I don't want to do, I don't, you know, uh, but, but it's important that somehow you express the love of Christ to others in that kind of setting. We all need to do that. We all need to have it. We all need to give it. So I would encourage us to do that. Encourage me. Anybody else? Any thoughts on So can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. Yes. Um, I, this is just something that um, I, one of my cousins posted on Facebook the other day. It says, be a lot for those who lost who's lost their will to burn. So we are, our light is, um, is pretty important. We're, we're not, not just a hug, we're light. That's right. We're, we're, the, we're the flavoring, the salt. We're the preservative. Yep. You know, on and on and on and on. We are those things. Those are our responsibilities. And we can fulfill them as long as we're empowered to do so. So that's why yeah. I say our job is to put ourselves in a place where we can draw that blessing from God and then give it away. A conduit. Or a reservoir is is a better thing. We're full, and then we can give out of our fullness. <laughs> Anybody else? I just wanted to say that sometimes it can be as simple as um, sitting with a person and just being with them and just not necessarily trying to fix them or judge them or tell them something wise, but just being there and yeah. taking their hand. And sometimes you lead people out of the darkness. God will work through you to, for you to be the light. And, and he will lead people out of the darkness through you, you know, like that more than the seed, like you think you're not doing anything, but you're doing so much just sitting with that person sometimes and I've even said I don't know what to say because I've never lost that person in my life or whatever but I can sit here with you and just be here you know Jesus said it's, it was a little different context but I think the meaning is true Jesus said don't worry about what you are going to say don't don't worry about it. That's not important. You'll you'll know what to do. Just show up. Yeah. Just show up. Okay. Uh, and, and yet, and we we stop because oh, I don't know what to do. I don't know how to say this. I don't know how to explain. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. You, you show up. So, and another reason, if I was going to say, um, for that's important for us to be a family. Um, if you are a private person, that is okay too. But I've always I've been told that it was really beneficial for me when a sister in Christ told me, you know, you need at least one or two people. In your life, that doesn't mean you have to tell the whole community everything about you or post it all or whatever, but there needs to be one or two sisters for me that I can tell everything to, that I get a reality check from, and I hear the truth from them about myself, whether I like it or not. I know those two ladies are going to tell me the truth, and I know God is going to speak through them so that I hear the truth from him too. So I think that's important to know. And you're right. 
you absolutely agree. Um, and uh, you've got to give yourself the opportunity and you've got to be the opportunity, both. So hope we'll do that. Anything else, guys? We've had, uh, I know, uh, this week has been busy for a lot of us. And uh, I'm thinking about Jennifer and Melvine, especially uh, Jennifer Foy, uh, you know, and uh, Chase is doing new things and haven't talked to him in a few days, but I know things are going on. So uh, it's a busy week. Um, we need to love each other and pray for each other. Think about each other. S say a little prayer, say a big prayer, but let's keep each other in prayer. Let's do the best we can in this situation to, to be that family for each other. So I encourage us to do that. Uh, I want us all to do that this week. Uh, pray for each other, love each other, help each other, contact each other, do what we need to do uh, to be that person. May the Lord bless you and protect you. May the Lord's face radiate with joy because of you. He wants that. May he be gracious to you show you his favor, and give you his peace. In Jesus' name, we ask it and say, let it be so. Amen. 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 Y'all have a good, great week. I love you. I uh, enjoyed being with you today. Jennifer, again, we're glad you're with us today. And uh, get well soon. Do a good job. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Bye. See you later. Bye. Next time. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.